Hello everyone, this is uh, Shadi Reis from CVI 2023. I'm really privileged to be with Dr. Tim Henry, who is the press president of Sky and who has been expert in the myocardial infarction uh, literature. Dr. Henry, thanks for being with us. Yeah, first, I'm delighted to be here, and I, I just want to uh, congratulate the, you know, the, the team for the CVI. So th this is a marvelous format, and, uh, you know, I've been in the coronary room, and uh, but the format this year is totally unique, and uh, it's, it's been fantastic. Yeah. And it's also unique to, it's my first time in Austin. Oh, yeah, me too. <laughs> kind of warm. <laughs> yeah, it's a little hot. It's, it's a hun over 100 degrees for y'all of you. Yeah. So, but, um, yeah, and yeah. I'm in a suit, not in the pool. So. <laughs> uh, so we'll talk a little bit about microvascular function. And uh, I think this has really become, people are realizing how important it is. And I think for interventional cardiologists, a lot of our unmet needs involve the microvasculature. So for example, uh, we obviously think about INOCA or ANOCA and MINOCA. So um, obstructive, uh, you know, angina or myocardial infarction without obstructive disease. And that's 75% in women, and that's a big part of the microvasculature. Mm -hmm. But if you look at STEMI, who are the patients who do poorly? Patients with microvascular obstruction. Yes. You microvascular do problem. And it's very slow to me too. Exactly. Yeah. If, and who are you, uh, if you look at PCI, both CTO and PCI, 30% of those patients still have chest pain a year later. A lot of that is Micro. microvascular disease. If you look at HEFPEF, half of heart failure, 75% of those patients have abnormal coronary flow reserve. So one of the key things, we now have better techniques to identify microvascular disease. So both from a non-invasive standpoint, MRI is fairly good. PET, really good PET, done maybe in only a handful of places in the United States right now, but it'll get better, is able to determine flow reserve and flow. So, and then invasively, um, I've, be, I've used Doppler for many years, and uh, so coronary Doppler is, really has been the gold standard, but we now have thermodilution with the core flow system. Mm -hmm. So we have ways to diagnose it. So let's just talk a minute. So the, the overall microvascular is important, but let's talk a little bit about Minoka and Inoka. Yeah. So the issue with Inoka is there's a huge number of people that have chest pain and non-obstructive coronary disease about 35 to 40 percent of coronary angiograms and if you look at this in women and women who and they have persistent chest pain and they get ignored so there's a study that came from uh, Cedars uh, Martha Galati presented the average no, woman has had chest pain for eight to ten years they've had four three or four angiograms or CT angiograms They've seen three different cardiologists. They've had more than five stress tests. And they so don't have, have a diagnosis. Yeah. So we need to make a diagnosis. And, and there's a, the, the, the um, uh, Cormica trial showed that if you randomize patients to making a diagnosis and following a treatment strategy or empiric treatment, and it showed that you do better if you have a diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And so we already have treatments that can make you better, but more importantly, if you identify these people and put them in clinical trials, randomized clinical trials, they can get better. Yeah. Is it because we, they, they receive the protocol, pro, uh, protocol medication yeah. uh, that make them feel better or because they get diagnosed sooner? and then eventually treat it? So the answer is both. And so let me, for me, and now doing this a lot, so um, we have a very large women's heart center and, um, and this is a huge unmet need. So almost every week I do four to six and um, yeah, of, uh, coronary function testing. Wow. And uh, That's a lot. either half Doppler, probably half thermal dilution. Uh, there's roles for both. and. Um, the point is, if you have primarily microvascular dysfunction, that's one treatment strategy. If you have primarily vasoconstrictive disease, i.e. spasm, either epicardial coronary spasm or microvascular spasm, that's a different pathway. Mm -hmm. 
And we don't do everybody. So we, we don't do people right away. We also use empiric therapy. If I think this is spasm, I'll treat you with a calcium channel blocker and, and PRN nitrates. But if you still have chest pain, class three, or it's still interfering with your life, despite our empiric therapy, you need to have um, a Function. diagnosis. Yeah. So what's the next step? And somebody has traditional lab, they have only physiology waters. Yeah, so this is great. So the, the, really important because I, I think a lot of people don't know and it's not available to them. So what we do is, uh, again, most of these people already had an angiogram or a CT angiogram. We hold drugs for two days. Mm -hmm. So they come to the lab without vasoconstriction. Right now, we're doing them all femoral, and that's because uh, if these are people who have vasoconstriction and you do radio, radio. there's a risk of spasm. And we don't know, um, I know everybody gives their local cocktail, but we don't know how that affects this testing. Yeah, okay. Europeans have used it radio, and so you might be, but I think it's, an, right now we do them all femoral. And uh, what I do is, um, the, the microvascular testing involves two things. Adenosine to look at coronary flow reserve, and acetylcholine, and we use a mid-dose and a high-dose. You can give acetylcholine with a bolus, or you can do an intracoronary infusion. We happen to use an infusion. We use the WISE protocol. Um, but mid-dose, normal people should dilate with acetylcholine. If you get vasoconstriction, that's called endothelial-dependent microvascular dysfunction. And then if you give high dose, then that's looking for spasm. And then you get epicardial coronary spasm. If so, not, what? if they don't spasm. Yes, if yeah. they do. Yeah, if they don't. Well, so if they don't, so there's also microvascular spasm. But when you finish this, and I, what I say to, to people who come in, you know, the goal today is you leave the lab, we're going to know what you have. Yeah. And then I don't just do one test. We do a series of things to make sure that the diagnosis is accurate. And then once we do that, we have a treatment strategy. So we just uh, sent in a paper with over 100 people who have microvascular disease. So this is abnormal coronary flow reserve that have a 75% improved with EECP. The ECP won't work if you have predominantly epicardial coronary vasospasm. Mm -hmm. And then there's people that have both. And then there's people that have epicardial disease, vasoconstrictive disease, and microvascular disease. And then there's people that have bridges. So the point is, it, this is complex. You have to understand, starting with a person who has chest pain and a poor quality of life. And our goal as interventional cardiologists, if you have chest pain and poor quality, our, our job is to find out what you have and try to make your life feel. We're not, it's not going to change mortality, but quality of life is really important. So, Dr. Henry, so you diagnose a patient with microvascular dysfunction. What yeah. will be your treatment strategy? Yeah. So if you have just endothelial independent and dependent microvascular dysfunction, common thing, the most common finding of this group of patients. Uh, number one, uh, I start with, if there's any epicardial disease, I use aspirin. Number two, a mainstay of treatment is lipid lowering therapy. And the reason is because um, abnormal high lipids affect your endothelium, right? So you want your LDL less than 70, ACE inhibitors have been shown to be beneficial in this patient population, and then the first anti-angelal treatment is a beta blocker. Yeah. So you, in that group of people, you start with those, and then you go from there. And then it depends on what their numbers are and what their actual diagnosis is. But these are people who typically have exertional chest pain, more than random, and um, typically it gets better with nitroglycerin. Um, and so uh, that's one patient. And that group of people, if they fail, uh, we will often use EECP in that group. Uh, another idea, and we can't go through all of them here today. It's a big algorithm. You, you, I saw one yes. of your papers, it's a huge it's algorithm. It's a big algorithm. And and we, especially for, your uh, acetyl in dosing, the high yes. dose, low dose. But an example for vasoconstrictive disease, empirically, I would never treat anybody with two calcium channel blockers. But if I know you have epicardial coronary spasm and you just closed your LED with uh, acetylcholine, 
I will easily go with two. Yeah. So amlodipine plus verapamil or amlodipine plus diltiazem. But I wouldn't do that empirically, right? Did no. You, no. And so knowing what the diagnosis is makes a big difference. But some people do that just to rule out things. Yeah, it, but I think it's safe. hard. I think if you, I, I think initial simple therapy is fine. And if someone has no angina, you're fine. That's good. But I think it's important to make a diagnosis, and I think with Minoka, it's also important to make a diagnosis. Absolutely, yeah. So the, la the last thing I'll say, because we, we don't want to go too far here, long here, but um, we have two papers from the microvascular network. Uh, it's a large group of people that are care about microvascular disease. Um, and uh, myself, um, Jeff Moses, Bill Furin, and Jennifer Tremel, who deserves huge amounts of credit for this. We have two manuscripts that will be in Jack in the next couple months, a part one and a part two, that we think is a really comprehensive approach to microvascular disease. And I think will be very helpful for everyone. Well, thank you so much for putting the plug for that, because as you said, this is very comprehensive. But again, uh, for, the peop for the physician out there, they can refer to the Center of Excellence for people who does it all the time time till we get more standardized protocol to, to diagnose these patients. And the last thing I'll say is um, if people out there are interested and want to be involved, want to learn how to do it, want to learn how to start a program, you know, I went to Christ Hospital just three and a half years ago, hired Adami Casada, she's head of our women's heart clinic, and it, it's exploded. It's a huge unmet need, and we're happy. We have people come all the time who uh, usually one day a week I do cases, and uh, so you can see both Doppler and thermodilution. Uh, we all can see how the clinic works works and what our treatment algorithms are. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Honey, for this uh, offer. Please watch with these videos and others on CVI YouTube channel. This is Shadir Reis from Austin. Dr. Henry, thank you so much. All right. Perfect. Thank you.